the economy of Japan. While its economic might is still widely respected, these days the Western world largely fears the rise of another Asian giant. But as it so happens, in 1989, the year that I was born, the world was simultaneously fearful and in awe of the rise of the magnificent Japanese economy. So what the hell happened? How did the economy of this Asian archipelago, which came so close to overtaking America as the number one economic superpower end in deflation and stagnation? I mean by now it's gotten so bad that the Bank of Japan in a desperate attempt to turn this situation around has bought up to 70% of government debt and has even become the biggest shareholder of corporate Japan. Hi, I'm Yuri and in these last few weeks I've been doing a lot of research to uncover the full story of how Japan's economy turned from rising superstar into stagnation. So grab your favorite drink, sit back and enjoy as I'll give this subject the proper deep dive that it so deserves. This story starts on a high note, the 80s, when Japan was still a growing economic superpower. Okay, technically this story starts in 1979, the year of the second oil crisis, which was caused by the Iranian revolution and subsequent war between Iraq and Iran. To save their economies from the fallout, all major industrialized nations, including Japan, responded by lowering their interest rates. This marked the start of easy monetary policy in Japan and set the scene for one of the biggest asset bubbles of all time. But this was not immediately obvious. After all, nationwide bubbles take a long time to develop and they might start in the form of a healthy, productive economic boom. Indeed, the Japanese economy of the early 80s was characterized by massive investments in research and innovation, partially made possible by these low interest rates but also by a little known secret monetary technique known as window guidance. You see, unlike Western central banks, the Bank of Japan had a very innovative way of creating credit in the right strategic industrial sectors. How it worked was actually quite simple. The Bank of Japan would simply go to Japan's biggest banks and give them a quota. This meant that it told them, create this much credit for the steel industry, create this much for the automobile industry and this much for the shipbuilding industry. And I know while I said it was a secret technique, it wasn't that secret because these quotas were printed in major Japanese industry magazines. But it was secret in the sense that the technique of window guidance was never really picked up by mainstream Western economists and that is why you have probably not heard about it before. I suspect that the reason was that it was incompatible with the free market ideology that dominated the economics profession at the time. However, one group of central bankers were paying close attention to the practice of window guidance and those were the Chinese, but that is a story for another video. Back to Japan, whose industries seemed unstoppable. So much so that the United States feared that Japan was going to overtake them to become the number one global economic power especially fearful of the destruction of the American car manufacturing industry, American workers flocked in droves to Republican President Ronald Reagan who pledged to do something about the trade deficit with Japan. And that he did, or, or at least attempted to do. First in 1981 he limited the number of cars that could be imported from Japan every year. And then in 1983 he slapped a whopping 45% tariff on Japanese motorcycles, reportedly to save American motorcycle icon Harley Davidson. But in stark contrast to the current trade war between the US and China, something remarkable happened in 1985. This is the year of the so-called Plaza Accords, in which European, American and Japanese politicians agreed that global trade was imbalanced and that the dollar was too expensive compared to the British pound, French franc, Deutsche Mark and most of all the Japanese yen. And so in these accords the Bank of Japan promised to sell massive amounts of its dollar reserves to make the yen appreciate and to depreciate the dollar in the process. And it worked. 
As you can see in this graph, after the Plaza Accords the yen started rising against the US dollar and while this proved troublesome for Japanese exporters, Japanese consumers saw their relative wealth skyrocket thanks to cheaper imports. However, to counter some of that upward pressure on the yen, the Bank of Japan lowered interest rates even further. The side effect of this was that with borrowing even cheaper, this scene was set for one of the craziest nationwide bubbles of all time. Now there is a popular argument that it was through these plaza accords that the United States was ultimately responsible for the Japanese bubble and subsequent destruction of its economy. I have to say I find that argument rather unconvincing because the Bank of Japan could easily have cooled down that bubble with stricter rules on lending or through window guidance. Still, low interest rates definitely contributed to the late 1980s bubble period, in which both property and stock prices went through the roof. So much so that it was estimated that at the height of the bubble, the small plot of land that the Kyoto Imperial Palace sits on had a higher valuation than all of California's real estate combined. And since all Japanese citizens appeared to become rich simultaneously during the bubble, Tokyo became the party city of the world where businessmen would spend cash freely on champagne and exotic dancers. Furthermore, with the yen riding high, Japanese investors flooded the world, buying up famous New York landmarks such as the Rockefeller Center and US companies such as But the Bank of Japan was not blind to the possibility of a bubble. In fact, if you dive into their records, you will find several mentions of bubble risks during that period. However, it was all talk and no bite. It was only in 1989 that the Bank of Japan started to raise interest rates. And that is what finally popped the bubble, marking the peak of the Japanese stock market, property market, and indeed the mighty Japanese economy itself. And while the Bank of Japan did not realize it at the time, in hindsight, this was the moment when the Japanese economy turned from miracle economy and fell into the arms of stagnation and deflation. But as it turns out, what drove deflation in the next three decades was the interaction of multiple economic mechanisms. Conveniently, the three most important mechanisms can be divided into three periods that largely overlap with the three following decades. That deflation in the 1990s, the inflation expectation traps in the 2000s, and population decline in the 2010s. Let's start with the 1990s. The first decade of Japanese deflation was also its most dangerous because it was characterized by a volatile combination of debt deflation and a banking system on the verge of collapse. The term debt deflation was coined by famous US economist Irving Fisher around the time of the Great Depression in the 1930s. The basic mechanism is the following. Picture a debt fueled housing bubble that has just popped. With house prices falling, most people are now left with both a massive mortgage and a massively devalued house. This house can no longer be sold to completely repay it. Therefore, if people want to move, they will be forced to repay their debts the old fashioned way, by tightening that belt buckle and buying less stuff. Now then, obviously, the overall demand for stuff will decline. However, the supply of stuff is still the same. After all, all the factories are still there and there are plenty of workers looking for a job. And so, since the overall supply of stuff is bigger than the overall demand for it, on average, the price of stuff will drop. This is deflation. What Irving Fisher realized is that when people are highly indebted, deflation will make it even more difficult for them to repay their debts because while the value of their debts will remain constant, prices and therefore the way that people might earn an income will spiral downwards. This of course means that struggling borrowers will spend even less, meaning that incomes decline even further, debts become even more difficult to repay and hence more deflation follows. 
to break this vicious cycle, central bankers need to act forcefully. For example, by decreasing interest rates to help the struggling borrowers out of the deflationary spiral. And it was with this in mind that the Bank of Japan did cut interest rates in 1991. But only by a little. In hindsight, it did not realize how big the bubble had really been and therefore it was too little, too late. Debt deflation had taken hold and prices kept dropping throughout the 90s, while the Bank of Japan kept cutting rates, slowly, vainly trying to break this vicious cycle. But that was just the start of Japan's problems, because not only had its borrowers gotten into trouble, this is also when Japan ran into a second feedback problem and that is the one between banks and the economy. You see, a faltering economy makes it less safe for banks to lend to the companies that are in it. And less credit for companies means less investment and hence a faltering economy. At this point it became increasingly clear that the Bank of Japan needed to take swift action to recapitalize the banks so that they would start lending again. And again it did, carefully. That is, if you consider injecting billions of yen into faltering financial firms being careful. The public certainly did not consider it careful, given that this created quite a bit of backlash. Why should governments rescue banks? And actually I get that, I even agree with that sentiment on moral grounds. However, the problem for central bankers is that banks provide an essential economic service money creation. So even though banks should be held responsible for their role in blowing the bubble, if you let them fail you might have the moral high ground, but you also have an economy that is completely destroyed. But yeah. That being said, there was a strong public backlash against bank recapitalization and this made further rescues infeasible. As a consequence, the banking sector remained in a slow downward spiral. A spiral that came to a spectacular spectacular conclusion during the dark days of November 1997, which marked the start of Japan's banking crisis. This came as a shock, since while most of Asia had been in the grips of the massive Asian financial crisis that had started in July of 1997, Japan and the yen seemed to have weathered the storm rather well thanks to the Bank of Japan's massive war chest of foreign reserves that had been built up using the proceeds of Japan's consistent trade surpluses. But then on the morning of November the 26th, 1997, the phone rang at the Ministry of Finance. It was the Bank of Japan. The message was simple. Lines are forming in front of the banks. This is when it truly sunk in. Seven years after the asset bubble had popped, Japan had its second moment of reckoning, a full-blown banking crisis. This was especially problematic since the Bank of Japan was not able to cut interest rates further since they were already at 0%. So in a desperate move to stop the panic, Japanese officials instructed the banks to let in as many customers as possible. After all, lines in the street would attract unwanted attention that might spill over into a nationwide panic and subsequent run on all banks. However, the move was in vain, the media was already aware of the lines. But then something happened that I think could only happen in Japan. Or, let me put it like this, it would never happen here in Europe. The news media universally, without pressure from each other or from the government, decided that it would be in the best interest of the nation to just not report on this. And so, in the afternoon, word reached the offices of the Bank of Japan that the lines in front of the banks had all but disappeared, and a true panic had been averted. Now, that doesn't mean that a financial crisis was averted. All in all, in 1997 and 1998, seven major financial institutions failed, and the banking crisis only came to a halt when, in spite of public pressure, several financial institutions had been saved with taxpayer money. However, one silver lining was that this painful banking crisis finally got rid of the debt legacy of the asset bubble. Debt deflation was finally over and the Japanese banking sector was ready to support a resurgent Japan as it entered the 21st century.
However, as we all know now, this did not happen. Instead, Japan found itself once again in a deflationary decade. But with excessive debts in the private sector gone, why did the Bank of Japan even care? I think there are two reasons. The first is that while the excessive debt problem in the private sector had finally been solved, the way that it had been solved by bailing out the banks meant that now a lot of that leftover debt found itself on the government balance sheet. And while that turned out to be less of a problem than economists initially expected, deflation is still not exactly great for a highly indebted government, since that debt does become harder to pay off as prices and therefore taxes fall. But there is another important problem with deflation and that is that it rewards saving and not spending. After all, if you can buy more stuff with your money by refraining from spending it now, then people are inclined to spend less money. And that is highly problematic since an economy can only work if people actually spend their money. This is why most central banks aim for consistent mild inflation rather than complete price stability. Mild inflation helps both the private sector and government to pay off their debts while it simultaneously motivates people to spend their money rather than to hold onto it. So okay, the Bank of Japan wanted inflation to encourage spending. But why was there still deflation? After all, this debt deflation mechanism had all but disappeared. The standard theory of inflation that the central bank turned to first is the Phillips curve, which implies that there is a relationship between inflation and unemployment. The primary idea of the Phillips curve is that low unemployment simultaneously means a lot of demand in the economy and that production cannot employ enough people to meet that demand and so both wages and the costs of all goods rise. This is of course inflation. Given that supply cannot expand quickly enough, inflation, according to this theory, mostly occurs in fast-growing economies. Therefore, the natural variable to look at next is unemployment during the early 2000s. Indeed, as you can see in this graph, unemployment had risen to roughly 5%, which was, while relatively low when compared to other countries, quite high for Japan. And with interest rates stuck at 0%, what was the Bank of Japan to do about that? The answer is monetary experimentation. Long after having abandoned window guidance, the Bank of Japan once again showed itself to be an innovator when it started a program that later came to be known as quantitative easing. The main idea here was that while short-term interest rates couldn't be much lower than zero, long-term rates, which are typically higher to compensate lenders for the increased risk of default, could be driven down further by using newly created reserves to buy bonds. Here you have to keep in mind that while we now consider quantitative easing to be quite normal, at the time it was very radical. But considering the massive quantitative easing programs of today, there was nothing radical about the scale of these early programs. Furthermore, the Bank of Japan stressed that they would stop the program right away once deflation would turn into inflation. And yet, while unemployment dropped, inflation did not come. But why not? Well, one popular explanation is that by now inflation had become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Let me explain with an example. In the 1960s, Japanese inflation hovered around the 5% mark every year. So in those years, Japanese labor unions typically demanded at least a 5% wage increase to keep up with inflation. This in turn led to increased costs for businesses who would, to remain profitable, increase their prices by 5%. Meaning that the next year inflation was also 5% and workers again demanded that same 5% wage increase. As you can see, this type of inflation is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Actual inflation at the end of the year depends on inflation expectations today. This is why if you go through as many central bank speeches as I have done for the research for this video, you will strikingly often come across managing inflation expectations rather than inflation itself. However, the problem for Japan was that during the 2000s, thanks to the debt deflation in the 1990s, Japanese workers were now used to mild deflation. Naturally, they expected this to continue and by the magic of self-fulfilling expectations, it did. In this light, it is less surprising that during this period the Bank of Japan was willing to experiment with something as radical as quantitative easing. It was so desperate to break through that self-fulfilling deflation cycle 
that it was willing to innovate once more. And you know what? Around 2006, it finally seemed to work as mild inflation re-entered Japan and the Bank of Japan figured that it could finally get rid of that wacky quantitative easing experiment and assign it to the dustbin of history. And then the global financial crisis hit and Japan was hit hard. In fact, even though the financial crisis itself originated in the United States, Japan's economy contracted by more than that of the United States itself. Now this was really unexpected since Japanese banks, still scarred from their experience of the 1997 banking crisis, had not really participated in the global financial boom and therefore, unlike their European counterparts, escaped relatively unscathed. However, the problem was that Japan was relying heavily on exports, particularly of cars, and when demand plunged in Europe and the US, these sectors in particular took a massive beating. Actually, this is quite a common problem for countries that rely heavily on exports. While it seems super safe to run consistent, massive trade surpluses, it does make you very dependent on the state of the rest of the world. But yeah, as you can imagine, this was not really a great turn of events for the Bank of Japan, who was still desperately trying to increase inflation expectations. And so Japan ended yet another decade with a recession and dipped back into deflation. Sure, this time the recession was brought on by foreign problems, but that did not make it less of a problem for the Bank of Japan. This also made clear to the Japanese electorate that radical change was needed, and boy oh boy, did it come. Japan economy is just about to break free from chronic deflation. In 2012, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe came to power on the promise of radical economic change and the agenda that he introduced... I don't know who chose it, who coined it, but they call my economic policy Abenomics. While the jury is still out on how effective Abenomics has really been, there's broad consensus that it was quite radical. When it was announced, Abenomics consisted of the so-called three arrows. The first arrow was monetary policy, meaning basically a continuation of the past, but amplified to the extreme. To give you an idea how extreme, consider the following propositions. Are your interest rates stuck at zero? No problem, just make them negative. Has quantitative easing not been super effective at bringing back inflation? No problem either, you probably just didn't do enough of it. How about you consider buying more, or even better, buying everything. For the Bank of Japan this meant start buying more short-term government debt, long-term government debt, corporate debt, and even, and this is really unique to Japan, enter the stock market. I mean, quantitative easing in Japan has been so extreme that now the Bank of Japan owns roughly 70% of all government debt. In comparison, the Bank of England is projected to own roughly 30% of government debt after the corona crisis. Also, the Bank of Japan recently announced that it is willing to buy up to 15% of long-term corporate bonds. And as a consequence of an even more radical stock buying program, they are now the single biggest shareholder of Japan, with some estimating that they own roughly 7% of the Japanese stock market. It's really hard to overstate how radical that is, given that at the start of the 21st century, the Bank of Japan was really on the fence about getting into this whole quantitative easing business. Now, the second arrow of Abenomics was increased government spending. On this front, Shinzo Abe promised big things as well, and indeed he did launch lots of spending packages. Under his rule, Japanese government debt approached a shocking 240% of GDP, making the Japanese government the most indebted in the world. Side note, this is much less dangerous than you might think, since most of that debt is owned by the Bank of Japan and the people of Japan. But yeah, while it sounds like Abe was a big spender, he also increased taxes on consumption goods in 2014 and again in 2019. These consumption tax increases are particularly infamous because after each time they were implemented, the economy found itself back in recession. And remember how the Bank of Japan was trying to shock the economy out of that inflation expectations loop? 
Well, thanks to Abe's back and forth on fiscal spending, inflation expectations hardly moved. Not very surprising, since under Abe's government, the pace at which government debt increased actually decreased. So yeah, more bark than bite on this front. All right, let's then move on to the third arrow of Abenomics, which was structural reforms. To be honest, I don't really like this term of structural reforms because it can mean almost anything. But in this case, it meant allowing more shareholder activism to increase competition among corporations, tax cuts for corporations, deregulation for corporations, and finally lots of trade deals for, you guessed it, corporations. Now, even with the broken promises on government spending, that should have been enough to reawaken the economy of the rising sun, right? Not quite. One big problem that Mr. Abe has run into when it comes to corporate Japan is that whenever they are given gifts such as tax cuts, they tend not to invest that money, but rather hoard it or directly turn it over to their shareholders who then hoard it. Since 2015, this has gotten so bad that corporations have been saving up to 5% of what they earned each year. Similarly, since then, households have increased their savings by up to 4% every year. Now, you can imagine that for the economy to reactivate, the household and corporate sector need to spend that stimulus rather than save it. And so, not surprisingly, while inflation was definitely higher under Abe than in the previous decades, it never hit the desired 2%. Also, consumption was barely any higher at the start of 2020 than it was in 2012 when Abe entered office. So, what went wrong? Well, for the first arrow, monetary policy, it turns out that while increasing interest rates can be highly effective at cooling down an economy, lowering rates to stimulate productive growth is much harder. You see, there's only so much further a mature economy like that of Japan can grow. If there is no demand among firms to invest more, you can lower interest rates, but they will likely just use this opportunity to fund higher dividend payouts to wealthy investors with cheap debt. You can also lower the taxes, but similarly, how can you be sure that they won't just pay these out in the form of dividends to shareholders? And finally, if you combine increased government spending with increased consumption taxes, it is pretty hard to expect shocking results. But that being said, there's one major theory about Japanese deflation that we haven't talked about yet, and that is... You guessed it, demography, because Japan's population is shrinking fast. In fact, as you can see in this graph, Japan's population growth reversed right around when Abenomics started. This obviously had a massive impact on the economy of Japan. After all, less people working means less wage income and less demand for products. And with increased automation to replace the workers that now enjoy their pensions, no wonder deflation has been so hard to get rid of. So this made me wonder what happens if we look at how the Japanese economy did under Mr. Abe if we correct for the shrinking population. As you can see in this graph, which shows GDP per Japanese citizen, the economic performance of Japan really hasn't been that bad, as long as you correct for its shrinking population. If you do that, actually it's been quite similar to that of other industrialized nations. So it makes sense that to truly defeat deflation, repopulation policies are needed. In other words, the central bank is just out of its league here. And indeed, to fight a decreasing workforce, Prime Minister Abe tried to increase both women's participation in the labor force and fertility by building many new daycare centers and expanding parental leave. He also tried to get more immigrants to work in Japan, for example, by making a fast track to residency for skilled workers and a guest working program for unskilled labor. But as leaders from Hungary to Russia to China have found out the hard way, reversing a strong demographic trend is almost impossible. So that left me wondering, is Japan doomed to forever be stuck in deflation? Well, while Shinzo Abe left Japanese politics for health reasons in 2020, his party is still in power. So it seems likely that most of his policies will continue. But will they bring back inflation, a stronger yen and heavens forbid repopulate the islands? I very much doubt it. You see, when something doesn't work, the answer is rarely, well, then let's just do more of it. 
So let's quickly go over the three arrows of Abenomics and see how they could be altered to generate some mild inflation. Up first is monetary policy. Here we directly come across an issue that I talked about in my video on quantitative easing. Namely, if you don't couple it with increased government spending, then all you are doing is taking one asset out of the economy and replacing it with another. This will lower interest rates on the bonds that you are taking out of course, but it won't give people much spending power that will generate inflation. It is more likely to lead to higher asset prices, something that will help further inflate the massive savings of Japan's corporations and households, but will not get them to spend and generate inflation. So if the Japanese government truly wants to generate inflation through monetary policy, it could consider either quantitative easing for the people, also known as helicopter money, which means that the central bank is creating money and giving it to people, or coupling massive QE with massive fiscal spending. And since we found ourselves talking about the second arrow already, fiscal policy, the other point I want to make about that is, if you want your fiscal policy to be inflationary, then you better make sure that that money ends up in the hands of those who actually spend it which are typically those at the bottom of society. Basically, what Japan has found out the hard way is that if your corporations and households are already saving whatever they can, you can give them more money, but all it does is make them save more. Finally, let's talk about structural reforms. Here again, I was surprised by some of the measures implemented. Tax cuts for the corporations, those that are already hoarding all the wealth, and tax hikes for consumers who need to spend more. Why not try to do that the other way around, at least if you want to generate some inflation? Another potentially more productive way to bring about inflation through increased wages is to improve the bargaining power of the Japanese worker. Structural reforms like that could even be combined with a central bank funded basic income. After all, if people don't have to work just to survive, then that might bring about some real power to ask for increased wages to do crappy work. And when it comes to repopulation, well, this is not my area of expertise. But I found that the most convincing explanations pointed to an insecure work environment for men and too little opportunities for women to have both a career and have babies. But yeah, on this front, if any of you are in Japan, I would love to hear your input in the comments. Finally, while increasing immigration might help, we know from other economies that you cannot do this too rapidly without risking great social tension. So I'm not sure this will be the likely solution to Japan's stagnation problem. But then again, as we discussed, Japan's economy actually seems to be doing quite well for its citizens. Its cities are beautiful and clean, its industries are still world class, crime is super low and overall quality of life is very high. Would it really be so bad to have a little bit of deflation? And on the bright side, depopulation might eventually lead to wage-led inflation at some point as labor gets scarce and wages increase. And with the large private debts of the 90s gone, debt deflation is hardly a risk. Furthermore, by now I do think that the side effects of extreme monetary policy action are getting out of hand. After all, financial markets have almost been completely taken over by the central bank. Is that something that a nation should aspire to? One part of why financial markets exist is to allocate capital to those companies that are using it productively. If the government just buys all corporate debt and most of the stock market, that function is completely gone. Sure, there are some publications out there that argue that deflation and the shrinking population make government debt unsustainable. But think about this, over 90% of government debt is owned by the Japanese. If Japanese people die, some of the government debt that they held will be transferred to their children and another portion of that will automatically be taxed thanks to the inheritance tax. When it comes to government debt, we should remember that the government is simply a construct that serves the people. And if the people own the debt of that government, then this debt is not necessarily a burden on future generations if the holders of that debt eventually die out. So yeah, I think the economy is not doing as badly as you might think. On the other hand, there is of course a good reason that people fret about low to no growth and that is that being young in a low to no growth economy can be pretty tough and insecure. Also a graying population will mean that the young will have to support more and more elderly Japanese, economically speaking. 
But hey, that's just my outsider's perspective on the matter. As an economist, I do think that if you truly want to understand the subtleties of a massive complex system, such as the economy of an entire nation, that you should go there and submerge yourself into that society. Sadly, the pandemic has made that a bit tricky right now. And therefore I ask you, my viewers, and specifically those from Japan, do you agree with my take? Or did I miss something? Let me know in the comments. And if you want to inspect the sources that I've used for this research, then go down into the description of this video where you will find them. And finally, to end my first video in which I just couldn't help myself and do a proper deep dive. If you want to support me making videos like this, then consider leaving a like or subscribing to the channel to keep up to date with more videos on monetary and macroeconomics.